Chapter Two, Part One of *The Princess Aline* by Richard Harding Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Two, Part One. The course of true love certainly runs smoothly with you," said Miss Morris as they seated themselves at the table. "What is your next move? What do you mean to do now?" the rest is very simple said carlton to-morrow morning i will go to the row i will be sure to find some one there who knows all about them where they are going and who they are seeing and what engagements they may have then it will be only a matter of looking up some friend in the household or in one of the embassies who can present me oh said miss morris in the tone of keenest disappointment but that is such a commonplace ending you started out so romantically couldn't you manage to meet her in a less conventional way i am afraid not said carlton you see i want to meet her very much and to meet her very soon and the quickest way of meeting her whether it's romantic or not isn't a bit too quick for me there will be romance enough after i am presented if i have my way but carlton was not to have his way for he had overlooked the fact that it requires as many to make an introduction as a bargain and he had left the duke of hohenwald out of his considerations he met many people he knew in the row the next morning they asked him to lunch and brought their horses up to the rail and he patted the horses heads and led the conversation around to the royal wedding and through it to the hohenwalds he learnt that they had attended a reception at the german embassy on the previous night and it was one of the secretaries of that embassy who informed him of their intended departure that morning on the eleven o'clock train to paris to paris cried carlton in consternation what all of them yes all of them of course why asked the young german but carlton was already dodging across the tan bark to piccadilly and waving his stick at a hansom nolan met him at the door of brown's hotel with an anxious countenance their royal highnesses have gone sir he said but i've packed your trunks and sent them to the station shall i follow them sir yes said carlton follow the trunks and follow the hohenwalds i will come over to the club train at four meet me at the station and tell me to what hotel they have gone oh, wait if i miss you you can find me at the hotel continental but if they go straight on through paris you go with them and telegraph me here and to the continental telegraph at every station so i can keep track of you have you enough money i have sir enough for a long trip sir well you'll need it said carlton grimly this is going to be a long trip it is twenty minutes to eleven now you will have to hurry have you paid my bill here i have sir said nolan then get off and don't lose sight of those people again carlton attended to several matters of business and then lunched with mrs downs and her niece he had grown to like them very much and was sorry to lose sight of them but consoled himself by thinking he would see them a few days at least in paris he judged that he would be there for some time as he did not think the princess aline and her sisters would pass through that city without stopping to visit the shops on the rue de la paix all women are not princesses he argued but all princesses are women we will be in paris on wednesday mrs downs told him the orient express leaves there twice a week on mondays and thursdays and we have taken an apartment for next thursday and will go right on to constantinople but i thought you said you had to buy a lot of clothes there carlton expostulated mrs downs said that they would do that on their way home nolan met carlton at the station and told him that he had followed the hohenwalds to the hotel meurice 
there's the duke sir and the three princesses nolan said and there are two german gentlemen acting as equerries and an english captain a sort of a d c to the duke and two elderly ladies and eight servants they travel very simply sir and their people are in undress livery brown and red sir carlton pretended not to listen to this he had begun to doubt but that nolan's zeal would lead him into some indiscretion and would end disastrously to himself he spent the evening alone in front of the cafe de la paix pleasantly occupied in watching the life and movement of that great meeting on the highways it did not seem possible that he had ever been away it was as though he had picked up a book and opened it at the page and place at which he had left off reading it a moment before there was the same type the same plot and the same characters who were doing the same characteristic things even the waiter who tipped out his coffee knew him and he knew or felt as though he knew half of those who passed or who shared with him the half of the sidewalk the women at the next table considered the slim good-looking young american with friendly curiosity and the men with them discussed him in french until a well-known parisian recognized carlton in passing and hailed him joyously in the same language at which the women laughed and the men looked sheepishly conscious on the following morning carlton took up his post in the open court of the maurice with his coffee and the figaro to excuse his loitering there he had not been occupied with these over long before nolan approached him in some excitement with the information that their royal highnesses as he delighted to call them were at the moment coming down the lift carlton could hear their voices and wished to step around the corner and see them it was for this chance he had been waiting but he could not afford to act in so undignified a manner before nolan so he merely crossed his legs nervously and told the servant to go back to the rooms confound him he said i wish he would let me conduct my own affairs in my own way if i don't stop him he'll carry the princess aline off by force and send me word where he has hidden her the hohenwalds had evidently departed for a day's outing as up to five o'clock they had not returned and carlton after loitering all the afternoon gave up waiting for them and went out to dine at laurence in the champs elysees he had finished his dinner and was leaning luxuriously forward with his elbows on the table and knocking the cigar ashes into his coffee-cup he was pleasantly content the trays hung heavy with leaves over his head a fountain played and overflowed at his elbow and the lamps of the fiacre passing and repassing on the avenue of the champs-elysees shone like giant fireflies through the foliage the touch of the gravel beneath his feet emphasized the free out-of-door charm of the place and the faces of the others around him looked more than usually cheerful in the light of the candles flickering under the clouded shades his mind had gone back to his earlier student days in paris when life always looked as it did now in the brief half-hour of satisfaction which followed a cold bath or a good dinner and he had forgotten himself and his surroundings it was the voices of the people at the table behind him that brought him back to the present moment a man was talking he spoke in english with an accent i should like to go again through the luxembourg he said but you need not be bound by what i do i think it would be pleasanter if we all keep together said a girl's voice quietly she also spoke in english and with the same accent the people whose voices had interrupted him were sitting and standing around a long table which the waiters had made large enough for their party by placing three of the smaller ones side by side 
they had finished their dinner and the women who sat with their backs towards carlton were pulling on their gloves which is it to be then said the gentleman smiling the pictures or the dressmakers the girl who had first spoken turned to the one next to her which would you rather do aline she asked carlton moved so suddenly that the men behind him looked at him curiously but he turned nevertheless in his chair and faced them and in order to excuse his doing so beckoned to one of the waiters he was within two feet of the girl who had been called aline she raised her head to speak and saw carlton staring open-eyed at her she glanced at him for an instant as if to assure herself that she did not know him and then turning to her brother smiled in the same tolerant amused way in which she had so often smiled upon carlton from the picture i am afraid i had rather go to the beaumarche she said one of the waiters stepped in between them and carlton asked him for his bill but when it came he left it lying on the plate and sat staring out into the night between the candles puffing sharply on his cigar and recalling to his memory the first sight of the princess aline of hohenwald that night as he returned into bed he gave a comfortable sigh of content i am glad she chose the dressmakers instead of the pictures he said mrs downs and miss morris arrived in paris on wednesday and expressed their anxiety to have carlton lunch with them and to hear him tell of the progress of his love affair there was not much to tell the hohenwalds had come and gone from the hotel as freely as any other tourists in paris but the very lack of ceremony about their movements was in itself a difficulty the manner of acquaintance he could make in the court of the hotel meurice with one of the men over a cup of coffee or a glass of bock would be as readily discontinued as begun and for his purpose it would have been much better if the hohenwalds had been living in state with a visitor's book and a chamberlain on wednesday evening carlton took the ladies to the opera where the hohenwalds occupied a box immediately opposite them carlton pretended to be surprised at this fact but mrs downs doubted his sincerity i saw nolan talk to their courier to-day she said and i fancy he asked a few leading questions well he didn't learn much if he did he said the fellow only talks german ah then he has been asking questions said miss morris Oh, well he does it on his own responsibility said carlton for i told him to have nothing to do with servants he has too much zeal has nolan i'm afraid of him if you were only half as interested as he is said miss morris you would have known her long ago long ago exclaimed carlton i only saw her four days since she is certainly very beautiful said miss morris looking across the auditorium but she isn't there said carlton that's the eldest sister the two other sisters went out on the coach this morning to versailles and were too tired to come to-night at least so nolan says he seems to have established a friendship for the english maid but whether it's on my account or his own i don't know i doubt his unselfishness how disappointing of her said miss morris and after you had selected a box just across the way too it is such a pity to waste it on us carlton smiled and looked up at her impudently as though he meant to say something but remembering that she was engaged to be married changed his mind and lowered his eyes to his programme why didn't you say it asked miss morris calmly turning her glass to the stage wasn't it pretty no said carlton not pretty enough the ladies left the hotel the next day to take the orient express which left paris at six o'clock 
they had bidden carlton good-bye at four the same afternoon and as he had come to their rooms for that purpose they were in consequence a little surprised to see him at the station running wildly across the platform followed by nolan and a porter he came into their compartment after the train had started and shook his head sadly at them from the door well what do you think of this he said you can't get rid of me you see i'm going with you going with us asked mrs downs how far carlton laughed and coming inside dropped onto the cushions with a sigh i don't know he said dejectedly all the way i'm afraid that is i mean i'm very glad that i am to have your society for a few days more but really i didn't bargain for this you don't mean to tell me that they are on this train said miss morris they are said carlton they have a car to themselves at the rear they only made up their minds to go this morning and they nearly succeeded in giving me the slip again but it seems that their english maid stopped nolan in the hall to bid him good-bye and so he found out their plans they are going direct to constantinople and then to athens they had meant to stay in paris two weeks longer it seems but they changed their minds last night it was a very close shave for me i only got back to the hotel in time to hear from the concierge that nolan had flown with all my things and left word for me to follow just fancy suppose i had missed the train and had had to chase him clear across the continent of europe with not even a razor i am glad said miss morris that nolan has not taken a fancy of me i doubt if i could resist such impetuosity End of chapter two part one